I'd like to thank you this morning for inviting me to come and share at your sunrise celebration of our Lord's resurrection. I love the tradition that your group has of coming together on the first day of the week to celebrate what the Lord has done. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eli, and I'm a descendant of the house of Levi. And though I'm not the most well-known among the eyewitnesses of the resurrection, I, I count it a privilege to be here this morning and tell my story. The first thing you might want to know about me is that my father was Simeon, who was a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord. Simeon has become quite well known for being the one who had received and recognized Jesus as the Messiah when he was brought to the temple in Jerusalem for his dedication. Simeon was a devout man and, and, and holy, seeking the consolation of Israel, seeking the salvation of Israel, our rescue, not only from the Romans, but from our own sin and shame. And Simeon had served his full 25 years as a Levitical gatekeeper and then had continued coming to the gate for many years after that because the Lord had made him a promise that he would see the Lord's Christ before he died. And so on that day, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her husband Joseph came to the temple, Simeon, my father, was there waiting. And the Holy Spirit showed him this couple and this baby, and he said, My eyes have seen your salvation, a glory for the people of Israel and a light for the Gentiles. And then he turned to the amazed mother and father and said to Mary, and a soul shall pierce your own soul as well. My father married late, and so I was still relatively young when that event occurred. I had not yet begun my own service as a gatekeeper in the clan of Levi, which David had designated as gatekeepers. But I began it shortly after that. And a little while later, my father died, he had said, oh Lord, I'm ready to depart in peace. And the Lord did take him home. And my father said to us on his deathbed, he said, I'm, it's a little bit like David, Eli. I will not come back to you, but you will come to me through the promise and the work of the Messiah. So I began to serve as a gatekeeper. I married my beloved Rachel. We had three children, two daughters, and then last, our son, Nathan. And this story is as much Nathan's as it is mine. Oh, Nathan, my son, my son, what a blessing you were, and what a burden. He was a good kid, with a good heart. He loved the Lord, maybe not with all his heart and soul and mind and strength, but he loved the Lord and wanted to serve him, wanted to see his Messiah, wanted to see his well done. But there was a streak of impatience in Nathan that often came to the forefront, a, a crucial part of his character. And sometimes Nathan's obedience would give way to his impatience, and he would act rashly and do things that he later regretted. He was always out and about, always talking to people, always helping people, always commiserating with people about the oppression of the Romans and wanting to see justice done, wanting to see oppression lifted. Now, standing for hours in a gate, which is what gatekeepers do, was not something that Nathan was well suited for. And so when he grew up, he became a different kind of Levite. He worked with those who received the sacrificial animals and brought them into the temple. 
And this gave him time to be in and out of the city, talking with people, caring for people, commiserating with people. And he had a lot of friends that he hung out with. And some of the friends worried Rachel and I. Uh, some of them were just sluggards. Uh, those who were more concerned with lying in bed and when they were up, going after wine and women. And those temptations worried us. But of greater concern to us was the fact that Nathan was hanging out with a group of people who had come to feel that God wasn't acting quickly enough, that, that God needed to rescue us from the Romans, and that people needed to stand up and take action. The leader of the group at that time was a man named Jason. And, and he, was, he was a visionary. He was a righteous man. He talked with the, uh, with the Pharisees. He talked with the Herodians and Sadducees, claiming to them that the time had come, that just as Judas Maccabeus had risen up and thrown out the temple desecrating Greeks, so now a generation needed to rise up and throw out the even greater desecrations of the Romans. That, that rhetoric, that talk, attracted by Nathan tremendously. But sadly, the leader of the group, this Jason, died early in a tragic death. And the, and the man who took over that movement was a man named Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas was not a visionary. Barabbas was a hateful man, a violent man, a, a man who looked for any opportunity to make trouble with the Romans. And on several occasions when Nathan would come back to the house, Rachel and I would warn him about Barabbas. But he blew off our warnings blandly saying, well, yeah, I know he's not the Messiah or anything like that. My friend Thutis, for Thutis had gone along with him into this group. My, my friend Thutis and I are, are just hanging out with these people. They never do anything. All right, they just talk about throwing off the Romans, and there's really nothing to it. We, Thutis and I, we're waiting for the real Messiah, the one Simeon saw, to come and with God's power oppose the Romans. And I said to, to, to Nathan at that time, well, you remember that what Simeon said was that this Messiah who had come would be for the glory of Israel and a light for the Gentiles. But my words bounced off him, and often, often as in his childhood, talking to Nathan was like throwing a stone in a rushing river. It just disappeared and there was no result. Things came to a head in his 28th year. I was serving uh, as a watchkeeper at the city gate and I came home that day and my Rachel ran to me and hugged me and cried and she said, Nathan has been arrested. He's been hurt. Something happened down at the Fortress Antonia. And so I went down there and talked to people and it turned out apparently that one of the Romans had uh, thoughtlessly uh, raised and hung one of the legionary standards off the wall of the fortress. And this was considered by most Jewish people to be an invitation to idolatry. And so a crowd had gathered and they were angry and Barabbas heard about it. And he grabbed his gang and came to the front of the crowd and drew out the entire Roman guard. And he was arrested and thrown in prison. And I, I asked, was anybody else arrested? They said, yes, one or two. And, and some of them were hurt. Nathan the Levite? Oh, I think so. I think he was bleeding. And his friend, Thutis. I got to visit Nathan in the dungeon of Antonia a few days later. And that was, that was a horrible place, dank, dark, stinking. Nathan himself was half naked, filthy, fetid, hanging from the wall, slumped against it, 
from two chains and with a bloody bandage around his torso where he'd been cut by the Romans. Through crack, cracked lips, he whispered to me, Oh, Father, I've been so wrong. I, I knew Barabbas was a violent man, but I never expected it to impact me. I never expected it to go along. And yet when we went to the front of that crowd and, and the guard came out against him, Barabbas rashly drew his sword against the Romans. And he actually succeeded in killing one of the Roman soldiers. He, he would have died immediately, but the Roman centurion said, no, not that one. That one is for a public crucifixion. And the Roman soldier, in frustration, turned and began to attack Thutis. And, and I couldn't handle it. I lost my mind. I grabbed up Barabbas' fallen sword and struck at the soldier. And that's the last thing I remember. Father, he said, Father, I've been so wrong. I, I knew that this was not where I should be. I knew that violence was not the answer. I knew that Barabbas had no heart for justice, no heart for the oppressed, that he was just a hater and an angry man. But I allowed myself to go along. I didn't leave. And now look what I've done. I've ruined my life. The, the penalty for this is death. I'll be gone before the spring is over. And he wept in my arms. And as much as I would have liked to have taken his pain and rescued his situation, I had no hope at that moment. The, the, the penalty for rebellion was execution. There were no exceptions. Oh Lord, I prayed, have mercy on my son. Save my son. I wanted to go to the trial of Nathan and the others, but I was not allowed into the governor's palace the day it happened. But it was short. And a, and, and a foregone conclusion. Barabbas and Thutis and Nathan would be crucified at the earliest opportunity. Fortunately for me, the Roman bureaucracy and its usual inefficiency couldn't quite make an opportunity happen. Every day I prayed, oh Lord, have mercy on my son. And every day there was no crucifixion until spring was well along. And this is where Jesus comes into the story. We, we had heard that there was another Jesus, not Jesus Barabbas, but Jesus of Nazareth, who had for a couple of years been going around Galilee, preaching the arrival of a kingdom, healing, casting out demons, teaching with great authority, calling the Pharisees in particular hypocrites. And as a result of this ministry and the, and, the, and the threat that they perceived, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians together were opposed to Jesus. The psalm is a threat to their position and to their power. As the spring went along, we began to hear rumors that this Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, that he would come and attend the Passover feast. And then we heard the most amazing story, right, that he had come as close as Bethany, just a couple miles outside the city, and that he had raised a man named Lazarus from death. The, this Lazarus was apparently a friend of his, and yet the, the, the man had died, he had been dead for four days when Jesus raised him up. And so marvelous was this miracle that crowds were flocking to Jesus in even greater numbers. And I knew for a fact that the Herodians and the Sanhedrin were deeply disturbed by this. 
I was standing guard at the gate one day when some of them came in, uh, apparently having been to Bethany to check it out for themselves. And one of them said, the whole world is going after him. And, and, and another said, but we need to be careful. The, the Passover is upon us, and, and we, we can't arrest him openly because the crowds will follow him. And then Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said, quietly then, but this man must die. The next day, I got to know and see this Jesus a little bit better. I was on duty at the city gate, and I saw the pilgrims streaming in down the Mount of Olives, and, and at one point I saw a, a huge crowd up there coming down the mountain toward the Kidron Valley. And as they got closer, I could see that there was, there was a man in the midst riding on the donkey, and they were shouting the traditional festal greetings, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then they added something which I had never heard uttered aloud. Blessed is the son of David. Blessed is the coming king of Israel. So they were declaring him openly to be the king that we longed for. And as they came in, I, I pressed myself back into an alcove and the crowd squoze, is that a word? squeezed through the gate and I saw Jesus close up. He, he was a plain looking man riding on a really small donkey. And on his face, a look that seemed to be a mixture of joy and deep, deep sorrow. I saw Jesus several times that week. It appeared that he was coming in and out every day, apparently staying in the town of Bethany. And, and so in the morning and in the evening, he would come, often always surrounded by a crowd of his disciples and followers, usually deep in discussions that I never did get to overhear. Apparently, the authorities could never find a quiet moment to carry out their plot until the day that we would celebrate Passover. Unfortunately, I had guard duty that day as well, so I was not able to go and eat the meal with my family, though it would have been a, a sad, sad time anyway because of the absence of Nathan from among us. Lord, I kept praying, have mercy on my son. But I saw Jesus in the evening after the meal time go out with a group of his disciples. I assumed they were headed back to Bethany. But shortly after, a large contingent of temple guards went out as well. And in their midst, I saw a man who looked familiar, maybe one of the followers who had come in and out with Jesus all week. They can't have gone all the way to Bethany, for they came back within about 45 minutes, and, and Jesus was walking, hands bound, in the midst of a large group of soldiers. And, and though he was their prisoner, he looked unbowed at that moment. The next day, I went to the governor's palace. There was a rumor going around that unlike Nathan's trial, part at least of this trial would be public. The pilot was going to appear publicly. And sure enough, after I'd been there a little while, as this large crowd was gathering, they brought Pilate's judgment seat out and set it on the stone pavement. And shortly after, Pilate himself appeared, surrounded by a large armed guard, as usual. And then the members of the Sanhedrin began to drift in from the temple area. Some of them, many of them, dispersed into the crowd, but a few went up and stood near Pilate. And then they brought Jesus in. 
And I was appalled at the change in this man. Apparently they had beaten him and flogged him. His, his face was swollen and a mass of bruises. His back was a bloody mess. And my heart went out. Lord have mercy, I said. Pilate had this tradition that he tried to keep, and I'd forgotten about it, but he stood up at that point and he said, So, who do you want me to release to you? Jesus, who was called the Christ, or Barabbas? And I thought to myself, no, not Barabbas. Bar Barabbas is a murderer. Barabbas is a violent man. Bar Barabbas is a wicked man. And I don't know much about this Jesus, but I don't think he's a wicked man. And, and yet the Sanhedrin circulating through the crowd was saying, choose Barabbas. Choose Barabbas. Lesser of two evils, one of them said. And then Pilate asked again, whom shall I release to you? And now the crowd cried out, Barabbas, Barabbas. And Pilate said, what should I do with Jesus? And the crowd spurred on by the, by the leaders cried, crucify, crucify. But he's done no wrong. Crucify, crucify. And then Pilate stepped away for a moment and washed his hands in a lava. And he said, I am innocent of the blood of this man. And to my horror, the crowd cried out, let his blood be on us and on our children. And then Pilate condemned him to crucifixion. So Barabbas, the wicked scum, went free. And Jesus was led out to be crucified with Nathan. Nathan looked terrible. His wound had apparently never healed. He looked feverish, thin. Why don't they just let him die in peace, I thought. <laughs> Lord, Lord, have mercy on my son. <clears throat> they went out through the city to the place of the skull and no miracle happened. No rescue. They carried out the sentences. Thutis cried out in defiance as they nailed him to his cross. Nathan groaned in a horrible pain. Jesus was silent as the hammer blows fell, saying not a word until they lifted the cross in place. And then he spoke and said, Father, forgive them. And they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, I thought. Forgive these who have tortured and flogged and beaten and crucified you. Who could say something like that? Who could do something like that? Who, in fact, could forgive the sin but God alone? And yet, if Jesus was this Messiah, if Jesus, and the ages were right, if Jesus was the baby that my father had held, the salvation that my father's eyes had seen, then maybe he could offer forgiveness even to a rebel who had done violence.
But the leaders scoffed at Jesus' words. Right, they gathered around and said, If you are the Christ, come down from the cross. <laughs> and, and the soldiers mocked him and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And even Thutis, uh, Thutis looked across to Jesus on his, on his right and said, and, and said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And at that moment, Nathan, who had been silent except for groans of pain, heaved himself up against the nails in his feet and looked over at Thutis and said, do you not fear God? For we are receiving the just consequences of our behavior, and, and we deserve it. But this man has done no wrong. And then Nathan looked and seemed to notice me for the first time standing there in front of his cross and our eyes met and I seemed to see in his eye a look of hope as well as despair and then uh, as if our eyes were on a cord we were both drawn to look at Jesus and Nathan cried out Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I, I must have gasped, echoing my own prayer. Lord, have mercy on my son. Lord, save my son. Remember my son. I don't know if I spoke aloud or not, but Jesus looked straight at me with a look of love and pity in his eyes. And then he turned to Nathan and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And a, and a flood of unreasonable hope filled my soul at that moment. What could this mean? What kind of rescue? What kind of salvation could Jesus be promising to my son? Was this the answer to the prayers that I have longed for? The prayers that I have repeated over and over? And yet no answer came. It suddenly began to grow dark, like the sun had failed, like a thick layer of clouds had moved in. And in that darkness, my hope faded. I looked around me at that moment and realized that I was standing among a group of Jesus' followers, most, mostly women and, and one young man. And, a, and an older woman got up and stood next to me. She gestured at Nathan on his cross and said, your son? I nodded. She gestured at Jesus. Mine, she said. Tears rolling down her face. And I remembered my father's words. A sword shall pierce your soul as well and my soul as the two hung there dying. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. But no mercy came. After several hours of this darkness, Jesus spoke once more. It is finished, he said. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
and then he breathed his last. His followers had permission. They took him down from the cross and took him off to be buried, I'm sure, before the sunset that would mark the start of the Sabbath. But my Nathan, my Nathan still hung there in agony. And the Sabbath came. And I kept vigil for the long Sabbath night as his breath came in gasps further and further apart. And finally, his dawn was breaking. He spoke once more. He said, Lord, let your servant now depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And then he breathed his last. It was the Sabbath day. I was not allowed to take him down from the cross. We were not allowed to bury him that day. So I went home. My wife and my daughters. And I told them the whole sad, amazing, story. And they made me repeat it over and over. And every time I told the story, I died three times. Jesus' death. Nathan's death. My own death. The next day, in the morning, gathered a couple of friends and we went to the place of the skull to retrieve Nathan's body. Rachel and the girls came bringing spices to wrap him in. And we made the long truck all the way across Jerusalem to where our family tomb was. <coughs> the, the, the women were afraid to touch him. So thin soaked in blood, so stiff, so dead. <laughs> but we wrapped him and closed the sepulcher and rolled the stone in front of the tomb. As we made our way across town, I saw a group of people walking the other direction, followers of Jesus. And, and John, the apostle, who I later learned was John the apostle, was there. He apparently recognized me from the hell of Golgotha, for he'd been standing next to me. In fact, he had spoken to me. He had said, believe the promise of Jesus. He had said that Jesus' words just days before were that he was the resurrection, that he was the life, that whoever believed in him, though he died, he would live. He told me that Jesus saw his blood as a covenant for the forgiveness of sins. And so it was that John who I saw in this group of people and he came up to me and he grabbed me by the shoulders, joy on his face, and he said, he's alive. And I shook him off, stepped back, took Rachel's hand. And I said, no, he's dead. John looked at me uncomprehendingly for a moment. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, your son. But Jesus, he said, but Jesus is alive. I've seen the empty tomb. 
so, some of the women saw him, saw him in his resurrected body, and just now, just now, he appeared to us in the room where we held Passover with him. He is alive. He's as alive as anyone has ever been. More alive. He still has scars. Scars on his hands. Scars on his feet. Scars on his side. But he is more alive in heart and soul and mind and strength than anyone has ever been. And I stood there amazed. Jesus alive? What, what could this mean? Well, what could this mean for the promise that he had made to my son, Nathan? And as I stood there, that, that, that overwhelming, unreasonable hope filled me again. But now I recognized it for something different than hope. I recognized it as faith that I did believe the words of this Jesus, this, this resurrection and life was true. <laughs> this salvation was true. And I, I learned later that that same faith had washed over my wife and my girls at that moment. And I, and I said to John, where is he? I've got to see him. Can you take me to him? I need to ask him what today in paradise means. And John said, we don't know. He, he appeared to us and then he was gone. He, he told Mary that he needed to ascend to his father and his God. He told the women that, that we would see him in Galilee, but we don't know when else we'll see him. And I said, Galilee? That's a long distance, but but when you go, take me with you. I've got to talk to him. I never did. And I never did actually get to talk to him. But I saw him twice. What once was in Galilee, and did through the week, through the days, I kept hearing that he had made appearances, the people from Emmaus and the disciples and Thomas and others, but but I never got to see him. I went with the group to Galilee, and there were many of us, some have said as many as 500 of his followers gathered on the mountain where he had told them to go, and as we stood there, Jesus appeared among us, walking and talking, and as alive and real as you are or I am today. <laughs> and I was only a few feet away from him, and some around me were openly doubting, is this Jesus? But many of us, myself, were overwhelmed with the glory of God seen in this man. Fell to our knees and worshipped him. And suddenly I, I didn't need to talk to him anymore. I knew that he was the life and that when he ascended to his father, there my Nathan would be with him. And I did see him not one other time. We went back to Bethany, and he appeared to us on the Mount of Olives. He told us to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on us as he has. And then he ascended and rose out of our sight. And as he went, I knew, as surely as I know anything, that he had shown mercy and brought salvation to my son. And that that day, before the throne of the Father, my Nathan would be with him in paradise. And I remember the words of King David. You remember when he lost his son? And he said, He will not come to me, but I will go to him. I will go to him and I will see him again and Jesus forever.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your rescue. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your sacrificial death. Thank you that in you our sins are forgiven and we are granted eternal life with you in paradise forever. Lord Jesus, I pray that in these days while we wait, that our hearts would be knit to yours, that your Holy Spirit would draw us to yourself. Lord, if there are any here who have not yet heard this good news and believed in you, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would allow them to see that you are the living Savior, the one who rescues, the one who shows mercy to those who don't deserve it, the one who forgives sin, Lord Jesus, I pray that among us, those who have followed you, that you would be glorified, that you would fully occupy our hearts and our minds and our souls and our strength until you come again. In your name, Jesus. Amen.